Test, test, test. Can you hear me? Yep, I can hear you. Oh, cool. All right. Unable to start video. OK, so you, you control that. Fine. Cool. Uh, I sent you a link to uh, S3 where I uploaded the, um, the notebook. Yep. I'm going to figure wanted... out a way to share it with everyone. And by the way, John, I see you're already in here. So just give us a few minutes. We're obviously setting up to get started at the hour mark. Cool.
All right. Hey, everybody. We're just about to get started. Um, still giving some people a little bit of time to get in. So we're going to wait maybe another two to three minutes. Um, and then with that, we'll get cracking with all, all the content. I see people starting to log in right now. So yeah, we're just going to give them a few more minutes. In the meantime, I'm going to be sharing a link uh, both in the Zoom. And if you're on the live stream with YouTube, I'll also be sharing a link there which is a download link for the demo notebook that we're gonna be showing off today. So if you wanna follow along, you're gonna to wanna to download that uh, in anticipation of loading it up. So just keep that in mind, I'll share that in a minute. But like I said, we're gonna give people just a couple more minutes to log in and then we'll get started. Thanks. All right, I think it's as good a time as any to get started. So first of all, thanks everyone who joined onto this webinar. I'm Rodrigo Aramburu. I'm one of the co-founders and the CEO of Blazing SQL. I'm also joined with uh, Tom Dravas, who is here on the call, who is our principal data scientist. And Tom will actually be taking you through the, the notebook that, that he pre-built for, for this talk and for a few other things that we needed it for. So real fast, what I'm going to do just to talk about the agenda, uh, I'm going to go over Blazing SQL and Rapids. This is for anyone who's not necessarily familiar. I have looked at the, in, the, the, the invitee list, and it does look like most people are relatively familiar with Rapids and the Rapids ecosystem. But just in case, we're going to do a quick overview of some components of the Rapids ecosystem, particularly as they pertain to Blazing SQL. And then we're going to just jump straight into the demos which you're all able to, to follow along. For anyone who's not familiar with how we do live demos, I put a download link in the chat of, of this talk or the chat of the YouTube live stream if you're on YouTube. And that just has a notebook, uh, an IPython notebook or a Jupyter notebook file that you can download. And you're gonna wanna drag that into the free app. And for anyone who does, isn't familiar with Blazing Notebooks, our application, it's at app blazingsql.com and it's just a real easy way to get started with blazing sql and the whole rapids ecosystem because it's a hosted gpu uh with a private jupyter lab environment that lets you go and just get started so great with that let's get started so again um blazing sql we're a gpu accelerated sql engine we're open source and we're fully built on the Rapids ecosystem. So let's just get into what that, what that explicitly means. So the easiest way to really think about Blazing SQL is think about it as a SQL engine that works on, on data frames. So you can actually run queries on, on things like Pandas data frames, but our core data frame and the way that we actually, you know, um, operate on data in memory is on the Rapids AI project QDF. 
So if you're not familiar with QDF, QDF is very much like Pandas. It actually mirrors the Pandas API. The only difference is that it's an in-memory object that, that is on GPU memory. So having it in GPU memory allows it to be, you know, incredibly low latency, incredibly high bandwidth, um, and also thousands of processing cores to be able to do massively parallel operations. And so this, this, this right here is probably the most basic example of what a Blazing SQL query could look like. Tom's going to go into pro relatively more complex examples. But what's really important here is if you're familiar with Pandas, this first line of code should look really similar to you. The only difference is that we've put in QDF as opposed to uh, you know, PD or Pandas. And we literally are just reading this CSV file directly into memory. And what's great about QDF is that it has a way of taking the header rows and understanding what the column names are, and then it does an inference on the data types. So this is how easy it can be to get started with creating a, a table inside Blazing SQL and knowing all the column names and things like that. So what you do then for Blazing is you literally just run this create table statement. We'll show the whole, you know, how all of this actually works in the demo. But this is literally how simple it is. You just name it and then pass in the in-memory object. And then we can go and start writing SQL. That's literally all it takes to just get started uh, and writing SQL. And what's interesting is this is, this is running SQL on a fully in-memory, in-GPU memory data frame object, um, which depending on your concerns or considerations and what you're trying to do might be um, exactly what you need because having it inside GPU memory means that it can be as fast as, it's basically as fast as it can get. Where Blazing SQL kind of starts taking this to another level though is you can actually create tables directly off of files. Uh, you can create tables off of files that exist inside S3 uh, or Google Cloud Storage or HDFS or what have you. And you can be running these SQL statements uh, directly off of those files without ever having to read them in, bring them in. And it won't be as fast as something that's in memory, but it'll let you run these queries. And it's still really, honestly, quite ridiculously fast. Um, and so, yeah, that's, that's what Blazing SQL is in a nutshell. When we think about the whole ecosystem, Blazing SQL doesn't really exist alone. It exists as part of a larger and greater ecosystem that's called Rapids AI. So if you're not familiar with Rapids, it's an end-to-end -end data science stack that's built entirely on top of CUDA GPUs. And so the whole premise of the stack is to basically enable incredibly high performance, right? Performance that just blows the mind at scale um, and for a lower, lower total cost of ownership. And we actually have some data to back that up that we'll be sharing with you. Blazing SQL, we already went through it, right? It's a distributed SQL engine that it works inside Python. It's a Conda installable package, and it runs on top of these GPU data frames and lets you run SQL. And then Dask is also a really great project that's really fundamental to this ecosystem. Dask basically allows us to scale things up from one GPU to however many GPUs we actually want in the system. And so in the example that, that Tom will be showing, he'll actually scale up a problem up to eight GPUs in his demo, but we have users uh, around the world who scale up beyond hundreds of GPUs and are able to make, you know, run SQL queries distributed across 100 GPUs plus, depending on what it is that they're trying to do. This is a slide I actually just found again. I, I, I used to show this off a lot um, years ago, but we haven't really looked at, well, not years ago, because Rapids is only two years old. So like a little over a year ago, I was showing this off a lot. But the reason I wanted to show it for anyone who's not familiar is Blazing SQL basically looks a lot like what QDF looks like. So if you look at QDF, it's basically this layer to Cython to Python. And we just added a few different components into it, like our communication layer, this Apache Cal site, this relational algebra engine, these storage plugins that take you know, SQL statements and convert them. Uh, well, actually, what literally happens is a SQL statement will come in. It'll then go to Apache Cal site where it'll get parsed. Apache Cal site is a is an open source high performance uh, SQL parser. And that'll then get converted into a relational algebra plan, which will then turn into a series of QDF C++ function calls. So as QDF gets faster, right? If someone pushes in um, a faster join algorithm, a faster group by, a faster sort on GPUs, then that immediately impacts Blazing SQL and Blazing SQL's capability of doing this. So we actually have one of our best examples is early on, an enterprise customer needed to be able to run SQL off of um, Apache ORC files. 
and the stack didn't support Apache Orc. And so they built an Apache Orc reader inside QDF. And all of a sudden, now Blazing SQL can run SQL queries on Apache Orc files in HDFS. Um, so that's, that's, that's really kind of what the power is of this, of this slide and why I wanted to show it off. And then this is kind of what the whole ecosystem looks like. So the ecosystem actually has a lot more components now. This is, uh, this, is this is actually pretty out of date because there's a whole bunch of other things that have been built, but this is kind of the bread and butter of the ecosystem. So on the left-hand side, we have our ETL and data prep tools. So we have SQL with Blazing SQL. We have data frame manipulation with QDF. And then we start moving into more analytics, uh, like machine learning with QML. For anyone who's not familiar with these, so if QDF is like pandas, QML is like scikit-learn. So it also mirrors the API of scikit-learn. And if you're familiar with scikit-learn and, and like using scikit-learn with pandas, the, the transition process is really quite seamless. QGraph is graph analytics, so it's network X, and it does the same thing. There's ways of plugging it in with deep learning, and there's also you know, visualization tools and things of that nature. We've kind of been beating Blazing SQL dead with a, with a stick, so I'm just going to hurry through this so that Tom can get started with his demos. But this is the way that you can think of you know, uh, a full workload where you have raw data in some sort of system. Maybe it's Amazon S3 in this particular instance. This is, this is complete. This is all you would need to run a SQL statement on a data set that lives inside S3, for example. And what you then get is you get a QDF. So this actually outputs a QDF for the user. And you can then pass that QDF off to anything that has integration with QDF. So one of the earliest examples was XGBoost. Uh, the, the NVIDIA team built a QDF uh, integration with XGBoost. And now all of a sudden you could be you know, doing feature engineering in your ETL process and SQL and data frame manipulations, and then hand off that data frame to a machine learning library. I want to, uh, I want to show off just you know, how we do at scale and, and what happens as you start scaling up. So TPC XBB is a really popular big data benchmark. So it's about analyzing big data, big data workloads, particularly on systems like Spark, Hadoop ecosystem, et cetera. And so right now, these numbers are actually out of date. We're going to be sharing some new numbers in a couple of weeks. I can't share them here because of, of a whole slew of different reasons, but they'll be coming out really, really quite soon that are going to just blow these away even more so. But when we're working with one terabyte of data, the, the current winner is, is Huawei with a configuration that they made on Cloudera, leveraging Hadoop and Spark. And they actually were running for about you know, $282,000. We were able to replicate the, the workload with a system that cost less than half that. And what we saw, this is a log scale, uh, this is a log scale y-axis. So we're seeing you know, really quite huge performance improvements. This is about like 45x. These are in the single digit multipliers of being faster. Purple is blazing SQL, green is, is Huawei. But over here on the right, we have you know, 200x performance improvements. Across the entirety of all the queries, we're running about 44 times faster. And I just chose basically the two best queries that we did, the two worst queries that we did, and one in the middle of the road, just to, just to kind of show what these, what these workloads look like. You can find these workloads on GitHub at rapidsai slash tpcx dash bb. And what, the, what you'll see in the workloads is it's a big ETL step, typically followed with some machine learning step or natural language processing, and so on and so forth. So just to finalize things before Tom gets started, how, how can I get started? You can download us through Anaconda. You can get Docker containers that we already have. Or you can leverage Blazing Notebooks, which is a fully, uh, a fully managed turnkey kind of pre-built version of Rapids ready to go. So with that in mind, we're just going to let Tom get cracking. So I'm going to give you the rights to be able to share your screen, Tom, by making you the host. And awesome. then Thank you. you can get going. OK. Welcome, everyone, while we're starting up. All right, you're now All right. you're now the host, so you should be so, able to take over. Okay, let me see if I can run this. All right. Okay, so uh, welcome everyone. Thanks, Rodrigo, for uh, you know for the nice introduction. I hope everybody uh, you know have a. Well, we started with the fact that most of you know what the Rapid AI ecosystem is, but uh, that was a really, really interesting overview. 
Let me stop sharing my screen. See if I can share this. Okay. Ah, oh, I'm gonna have to quit now. Rodrigo, can you uh, take over for a second? It looks like my preferences they uh, they kick me out. Oh, no worries, no worries. Yeah, sorry about that. I'll be right back. All right. So while Tom's doing that, I'm gonna answer some questions. I was actually gonna type out some answers to these questions, but I can just do it real fast. So Justin Miller asks, can Rapids run distributed across multiple servers as well? So for I don't know if this question was asked before I kind of mentioned it, but yes, yes, it can. So we've run on systems that have, you know, dozens and dozens of independent network connect servers, and they themselves have, you know, between six to eight GPUs inside of them. So we're talking hundreds of GPUs that are networked together and, and you can make Rapids work over across all of them. And we leverage Dask as the main way to do that. So Dask is what builds an awareness of all those network connected uh, servers and those GPUs and make sure that the jobs are running. So if you want to do QDF like jobs, uh, which are pandas like jobs, then what we're talking about here, I'll start my video up. I realized since Tom's re re jumping back. Yeah. Okay. I'm just going to finish up this question and then you can, you can get yep. going. By all means. Um, where was I? So yeah, so that's how you do it. You do it with Dask and that's how you can scale it up to, to as many servers as you necessarily want. And then, Tom, do I need to make you host again? I believe you do. All right, here you go. Here's hoping that this works now. Okay. Okay, I think I should yep. be sharing right now. Cool, all right. So uh, sorry for that. Uh, so here we are. Uh, I have already downloaded the uh, the uh, the notebook that we're going to be using in the uh, you know the free app that we have. So if you go to app.blazing.com, uh, you should be able to log in with your Google credentials and uh, pretty much get started with everything that we have prepared for you today. Uh, I already have downloaded the um, the notebook itself. Uh, I believe Rodrigo has pasted the the uh, the link to the notebook uh, in the chat. So if you haven't done that, uh, go ahead and do that right now. I will create a, a folder for myself uh, in the main, in the root of the, of the app, and then just drag and drop, drag and drop the notebook itself there. So you should be able to see, uh, you know, see the screen and also follow, uh, you know, on your own pace um, uh, you know, in, in, the, in the app if you log in. So what we're gonna be talking today about is the parking in Seattle. Uh, a while back when I was, uh, you know, playing with the Kudiev, I was looking for some data uh, on the web. And since I live in Seattle, I stumbled upon the city of Seattle uh, uh, Department of the Transportation. Uh, there's a big open, uh, you know, open data portal. Uh, what they effectively allow you to download uh, parking transactions. These parking transactions are collated annually. So you can go as far back as pretty much 2016. And that's, uh, that's where we're gonna start in the, uh, when we're gonna showcase the larger data set. Uh, but for this particular example, we have already uploaded uh, two months worth of data uh, you know, uh, into S3. And that's what we are going to be using in this, uh, in this, particular, uh, in this particular instance. Uh, what the data contains is roughly every single transaction that happens when you go and find a parking spot and you swap your card uh, in the meter. Uh, there is roughly 1500 uh, you know, uh, block faces, which is effectively translating to, okay, I can park along this road uh, you know, uh, in Seattle. And that's what the data, what the data uh, showcases. Uh, you will also notice as we go through the examples that there is no, um, you know, data for Sundays because the uh, the parking on Sundays is is free in Seattle. Uh, so first things first, we're going to start with loading the modules. We will download the Blazing context from Blazing SQL. Uh, we will also, as Rodrigo was mentioning, we will be using a CUDA cluster. So in this particular case, we're going to be using Dask. Dask provides uh, two ways of uh, creating your client. So when you start Dask cluster, you start effectively a Dask scheduler that acts as a, uh, as a head node for the whole, 
uh, you know, for the whole uh, cluster that you, your client, uh, will effectively interact with. What you say, what you then do is just literally connect the client to the head node, and the head node will translate all the requests that go into the head node and then distribute that work to, to all, the, all the clients, all the workers. Uh, we, of course, import also QEF. We're going to use pandas. We use pandas effectively to just set up this display max rows. We want to show uh, this, this particular option from pandas allows you to show uh, you know, up to 100 rows. Uh, and then effectively, we create the local CUDA cluster. This is a different. So if you have a cluster that is spanning multiple machines, you don't necessarily want to use the local CUDA cluster. Local CUDA cluster is useful when you have a single uh, you know, uh, a single machine with uh, either one or multiple GPUs, then you can create a local cl CUDA cluster that will implicitly start the task scheduler on your machine and also instantiate as many workers as the GPUs you have uh, uh, on your machine. Now, uh, I will ask you to take the pull equals to true out. I forgot to do that. Uh, but once you do that, we can run the first cell and what happens right now, we're going to instantiate the blazing context. So what, uh, you know, blazing context will do, it will go to all the, uh, you know, to the head node and all the workers and instantiate the blazing contents within, within each worker. So now that we have the uh, BC object, uh, we can use the, one of the uh, storage plugins that are already built in into blazing SQL and connect to a BSQL uh, bucket from uh, you know, from uh, S3. If you execute this, we already have registered um, the uh, the bucket with the with the blazing context, so we can start accessing the data uh, that is present in the bucket. Now, this is th this particular bucket is a publicly available, so you can go there and then just uh, you know uh, access this data without authenticating. If you have a bucket that is uh, your private bucket, you can also register that with Blazing SQL by simply providing the secret, uh, you know, uh, keys uh, within within the call, and that way you can access the data in your own secure way. Now let's have an overview of how we create the tables. I know because I uploaded the data that uh, you know in this particular location in Data Seattle Parking and Parking May June two thousand nineteen. I have a parquet uh, file that is partitioned into 40 partitions. So effectively what I'm doing here is I'm creating a list of 40, uh, 40 paths to S3. So I can actually uh, register that table uh, later on with the Blazing, uh, Blazing SQL context. Uh, we also have the parking locations uh, you know, uh, table over them. Now the difference, the way we did this is um, the way the data is published from the, the, the Seattle uh, you know, parking, uh, the Department of Transportation, the data set itself, uh, every single row in that particular uh, data set has all the metadata about every single parking uh, you know, spot that was uh, literally uh, you know, the, the, the transaction took place on, which seems a little bit wasteful. So we decided that, okay, well, we're gonna separate that and then create this you know, more, database field uh, where we can have a just a small uh, set of 1500 rows in parking locations that will carry over all the uh, you know uh, all the metadata about the, the the parking location and then have a key that we can join back to the transactions that will be trimmed down to only the necessary the necessary columns so if we run this it will effectively create all of uh, these particular uh, objects for us now, uh, this particular data frame, this is purely to, uh, you know, later on for visualization purposes to map the date of the week zero to Monday. So uh, this is really not necessary to explain. So this table is created. This will be a QDF table. Now, this particular uh, cell right now, when you start executing that, uh, it will create and register the, the tables uh, with the blazing context. So we're going to have access to a table that is called parking transactions, un, uh, parking underscore transactions that we got from the, uh, you know, parquet file that is, uh, you know, on S3. We, are, we have created a parking locations uh, table and the date of the week, uh, day of the week uh, 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 table as well. So we're going to have access to all of these tables uh, from now on moving forward. The way I normally start working with data, I start to get, uh, you know, I, I like to start to, to get some familiarity. 
with the data itself. So uh, first of all, I want to see what I'm dealing with. So in this particular case, the, the SQL transaction here it is uh, selecting 10, 10 random, uh, random uh, records from the, from the top, pretty much uh, 10 run, uh, uh, records from the parking transactions table. So now we have those top 10. Uh, let's see how many, uh, you know, how many records we're dealing with. So how many records do we have in the table for the two months that, uh, you know, that we've, uh, you know, we've selected from the data set. And then when you run this, this takes a little bit longer, but we have around 49 million records in those, uh, you, know, uh, for, for, you know, registered in the data set that has two, uh, two months. Bear that in mind because we're gonna scale it up way beyond that uh, uh, when, I, when I showcase you the larger one. Uh, in terms of columns, we have four columns. Uh, the occupancy date time, which is effectively a, uh, you know, when the transaction took place, paid occupancy, which indicates how many uh, total spots were occupied at that part, uh, point in time. Uh, source element key, this is our key. We're gonna be joining that to the metadata about the parking locations. And the day of the week, which is a column derived from the occupancy date time. Uh, if you want to look it up, if you want to look up, uh, you know, the date types we deal with, uh, remember when Rodrigo told you that, uh, you know, any bc.sql BC transaction returns a QDF, we can quickly uh, use that functionality from QDF to, uh, you know, see that occupancy date time is a date time 64 uh, uh, column and paid occupancy and source element key are in 64s and day of the week is uh, int 8. Uh, in terms of, uh, you know, uh, looking in and peeping into, uh, you know, what the data really looks like, uh, if you actually run this this way, it will, uh, you know, because we are using Dask cluster, uh, it will retain, uh, you know, just literally a Dask uh, data frame structure. So it will tell you, okay, well, I'm going, this is what I, my plan is, or, you know, what I'm going to do if you tell me to do it, right? Right now, we haven't executed anything. If you were to look into the Blazing SQL, uh, sorry, uh, Dask dashboard, you would not see any movement over there. As soon as you start, you know, add compute, you tell Dask to finally execute this, and then you can see, you can get a uh, QDF back. Only at that point, the Dask will actually execute the, the query that you, uh, that you did. And then we're gonna go in the same fashion through the parking locations. So parking locations, this is effectively the whole, uh, you know, a list of uh, descriptors of the, of the parking location. So you can see we have 1500 records uh, roughly around the and nine columns. The list of columns is we have our key that we can join back to the parking transactions, but we also have block face and side of the street and parking time limit category and so on and so forth. All of these, we have the same times. I'm not gonna go direct, you know, uh, precisely through every single um, column over here. One point that I want to draw your attention to is the location. And when you actually run this, this table, this uh, uh, cell here, you can see that the location is in a format called WKT, well-known text. Uh, and effectively it's an encoded, uh, you know, uh, Latin long location uh, of, of that particular parking spot. And we're gonna use that later on to find what is the nearest uh, parking spot to the Space Needle uh, within a certain radius from the Space Needle that we have the highest chance to, to find a free parking spot on a given day of the week and uh, around the same, uh, around the, uh, some particular uh, point in time, time of the day. Uh, we do have some duplicates in the parking locations. So this particular um, uh, command, uh, the, the cell here, effectively drops the, the duplicates that we have on the source element key. Uh, it's not a not a big deal. So when I mentioned the uh, you know the parking locations, when we work with uh, you know the parking transactions, uh, our ultimate goal is to find okay, well I want to go to visit Space Needle. I want to go to see you know park somewhere downtown in Seattle. I want to have a look. Uh, if I plot in my, the, the coordinates of, uh, you know, where I want to go, can you tell me at this point, you know, uh, on Wednesday or Thursday around 1 p.m., what are the closest 
uh, you know, closest parking spots that I have the highest chance of finding the, 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 uh, the parking there. So uh, what we're going to do is uh, just like in the SQL, uh, SQL way, uh, way, we will extract the year, month, day of the month, and hour from the occupancy date time. So this is effectively, you know, straight up SQL, uh, you know, query that you can look up online and then, uh, you know, Blazing SQL supports all of this. And uh, right off the, you know, right off the bat, that takes, you know, a couple of seconds to do. So we can now check how many transactions we get per day, right? So if you look at this, we can see that we have roughly somewhere in the vicinity of 900,000 transactions per day. So every single day we see around 900,000 transactions happened, uh, you know, uh, being, uh, you know, processed by the city of uh, Seattle or from the Department of, uh, Department of Transportation. So if you calculate, you can calculate the, uh, the mean from uh, the counts uh, table that we have created over here. And by the way, so this is, uh, you know, just <laughs> uh, to, 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 to draw your attention to how fast this is. We have right now literally went to 48 million, uh, you know, uh, rows, table, parking transactions has 48 million, 49 million uh, uh, rows and did a aggregation on year, month, and day, plus, you know, we counted how many rows we have there, and it only took one second. Uh, the way we featureize parking locations, what I want to do, ultimately, we will have to calculate the distance. And in this particular example, we will be focusing on the hover sign distance, i.e. the, you know, just the straight line from where we want to go to uh, a parking location. In order to do that, we actually need to get out uh, the latitude and longitude from, uh, you know, from the, the point, the well-known text format uh, object that we have there. So the way we do it uh, right now is uh, we are finding, uh, w w if you were to print out that particular, uh, you know, th that particular example of the well-known format, you would know, you would see that there's a point and then in parentheses, there is the, uh, you know, uh, longitude first and latitude second. What we do is we find, and they are separated by space. So uh, in this particular case here, we are finding that space where the location of that space is. And then that gives us this delimiter location that gives us where we going to start extracting uh, the latitude. So uh, in this particular case, we're using a substring, uh, you know, substring uh, functionality from SQL that we say, okay, we'll take substring, uh, go to take location, start at this particular, uh, you know, uh, location, and then, uh, you know, uh, give me as many, uh, you know, as many uh, 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 characters after as, uh, you know, uh, the length, length of the uh, uh, length of the string is minus the delimiter location. So effectively, we, we extract that. For the longitude, we uh, start at point eight. So we go, we pretty much do the same thing, but uh, we start at the character number eight because that's effectively the first character after the, the opening uh, parenthesis. And then we, uh, you know, we uh, extract the, uh, the, the subsequent uh, number of, number of uh, uh, digits. So if you run this, we can now calculate the average occupancy at every single parking spot, right? So what we do is uh, we will actually, this is an example of, uh, you know, how flexible and how SQL-like Blazing SQL Engine is. You can have not only, you know, just query the data, but you can, you know, uh, execute quite, um, you know, sophisticated complex queries against the engine itself, and it will understand that, right? So in this particular example, we have an inner query that is actually going to this 48 million rows uh, parking transactions table, does a left outer join on parking locations where we extract the source element key and then parking space count from that particular location, right? And then we join that on the source element key, uh, source element key here. So that's our inner join. We, I call it the, uh, you know, an alias for this is an inner table. And then what we do then is we effectively create, recreate the parking transactions. So what we do, we uh, append additional information to our parking transactions table, 
where for every single uh, row in, the, uh, in that transaction, we will have the average occupancy at that particular time, point in time, which is effectively the paid occupancy divided by the paid, uh, parking space count. We didn't have the parking space count in the parking transactions. So that's why we do this left outer join in order to bring it over from the parking locations table. So if you run this, once again, this is 48 million rows joining to a table that is 1500 rows, and it takes 1.28 seconds to do all of this uh, on a GPU, on a single GPU uh, or in memory, right? So we now have a source element key when the transaction occurred. Uh, we have the paid occupancy and paid uh, parking space count, the average occupancy, uh, day of the week and uh, hour of the day. So now if we wanted to, uh, you know, what, what we really want to is look at these past two months and for every single uh, source element key, day of the week and hour of the day combination, calculate what it was the average occupancy at that point in time on that particular given, uh, you know, uh, uh, week of the uh, day of the week and on that particular source element key. So in this particular case, we literally pipe the, uh, you know, the QDF that it gets created by calling bc.sql and create on the fly a new table that we call means. And that takes uh, half a second. So once this is done, now we have access to the means table. What we can do right now is to, uh, you know, just calculate the average per day of the week and per hour uh, you know, uh, what, what does it really look like? And is there any, uh, you know, any seasonality that we see in the data? So if you run this, you can quickly, from the mean occupancy uh, QDF, richly run that query, convert it to pandas, set the index to be uh, day uh, of the week as a string. So the, the thing that we did here, as I mentioned before, when we created the uh, day of the week table, uh, we left out the join to the uh, day of the week table. And then instead of carrying over and then uh, presenting later uh, day of the week as a number, we actually encode it to a string. Uh, we take the mean occupancy um, column there, and then we effectively use right now at this point in time, we are back in the host memory. So because we've converted to pandas, we can just quickly dot plot, uh, you know, dot plot that, uh, that data. So in this particular case, as you can see, we have a strong, uh, you know, day seasonality, right? So we can see that, you know, uh, uh, the parking occupancy peaks around midday, then trails off a little bit for the, uh, for the afternoon where people go back home. And then it can, you know, comes back for the night, uh, you know, the evening hours where people might go out and, uh, you know, go for, uh, to the movie, see a movie or, uh, you know, go for, uh, you know, for, for dinner. Uh, in a restaurant. You can also see that when we start on Saturday, that's an effect of, you know, uh, Friday night. So there's a much, like not much higher, but substantially higher uh, parking occupancy uh, on Friday, Friday evening, where you can see, and then it quickly trails off for, for Friday, uh, for Saturday night. So people go back after spending the night uh, in downtown Seattle. So, now that we understand the data, we know what we want to do. Uh, let's find the best parking spot. So uh, as I said, we're going to go to the Space Needle in Seattle. I've looked up the lats and long for, um, uh, for Space Needle in Seattle. So we're just going to append that uh, to our parking locations uh, table, right? So right now we have lat and long for uh, every single parking um, uh, location in, uh, in Seattle. And then we have the reference point to where we really want to go. So that this particular column and, and, and these two columns are the same for the whole, uh, for the whole uh, table. Uh, and we're going to calculate the hover sign distance to, uh, you know, to, the, um, uh, to, to every single, uh, single location from Space Needle. So the way we do it is uh, effectively we're using the hover sign uh, distance formula where we convert the uh, lats and long to rad, uh, you know, radians, and then calculate the, the differences between lats and longs, and then use the, um, you know, effectively the hover sign formula, which is encoded in this line and this line, 
in order to calculate the distance in feet, in this particular case in feet, uh, to uh, every single parking locations from, uh, from Space Needle. So when you run this, this takes just a little, uh, you know, a, a, a tiny little time. We can drop the table right now. So this table effectively goes away and you go no, no longer gonna have access to, uh, to the temp table that we have uh, registered before in this particular cell. And then what we're going to do here right now is uh, we assume that we want to travel to Space Needle on Thursday around 5 p.m. Uh, and uh, we're going to lift out a joint to our means table where, uh, because we want to carry over this mean occupancy. We want to later on sort uh, by the distance in feet, but also we want to carry over this uh, mean occupancy, uh, you know, uh, mean occupancy uh, column over. So when you compute this, it takes 0.2 seconds and it tells you that, okay, well, the closest to, um, uh, the closest uh, parking spots to C uh, Space Needle uh, on Thursday, 5 p.m. Uh, within 1,000 feet radius and with the mean occupancy less than five, uh, you know, less than 50% uh, is the RD6 parking location. So if you're willing to, you know, walk a little bit further, so 900 feet to Third Avenue between Clay Street and Broad Street in Belltown, you have a really high chance of finding a parking spot over there and then you can go and then uh, you know explore explore space space needle so long story short if you were to run this notebook by literally going to you know uh, run from the top to the bottom you would be processing 48 million 49 million records and and uh, you know 1500 records in the, in the other table and it would take you roughly five to six seconds to go through the whole notebook and get the answer that you want. So that's pretty much almost, uh, you know, real time processing, uh, you know, using, using Blazing SQL Compact, uh, you know, uh, engine. Uh, I, uh, Rodrigo, what do you think? Do you, should we pause here for any questions or should I go ahead with the, the, the large, uh, the large uh, example? Yeah, I've been answering questions as they pop up. So you can go to the other example. That way we have a little bit of time for Q&A. So you might want to jump in, scale it up, and then we do some Q&A. Sounds good. Okay. So uh, I will, uh, I started this uh, cluster uh, earlier today. So it, it shouldn't take too long, but I started this cluster. This is the, the new, uh, you know, beta uh, version of Blazing SQL, where you can go back to the app that we've been using so far but you can also uh, create your own private GPU cluster, right? And then if you click on this particular, uh, you know, uh, if you really have, uh, you know, you've purchased uh, some tokens, purchased credits, uh, you know, uh, on, on, on in this view, you can create your private GPU cluster. We can, uh, you know, name it Tom webinar, for instance. And uh, in terms of size, uh, we provide you effectively, uh, you know, um, from the smallest to the largest, right? So you can have a GPU, your private own private GPU with one uh, GPU, two GPUs, four GPUs, eight GPUs, 16 up to 64. Uh, and additionally, if your cluster, if you leave your cluster unattended, simply because, uh, you know, uh, of course you don't wanna pay for, you know, for the cluster, if you don't use it, you can choose that, okay, if you have, if we have noticed that you haven't been doing anything uh, on the cluster for five minutes, for 15 minutes, for 30 minutes, or up to one hour, we'll automatically shut it down for you and then you stop charging you, uh, stop charging you for that. Uh, so this is the new, uh, the new, uh, you know, the way you can actually, you know, take whatever you've been working on the free instance and move it over to, uh, you know, to your own private GPU cluster where you can scale it up to a, uh, you know, the, the actual workload that you need to, uh, you need to support. So in this particular case, we are already up and running. You can click on launch Jupyter. It will take you to a familiar spot, uh, you know, with, uh, you know, pretty much the same, uh, you know, uh, you know, with the, with the same, uh, almost the same notebook. Right. So in this particular case, I have a large, uh, this is the large example, right? Uh, and I'm going to walk you through the differences between what we've already shown in the small, small one. And what is the difference here? You want to update your, your client IP, by the way. 
my client IP. That's good call out. Yes. So let me do this. Okay. So my uh, automatically when you start the uh, the cluster itself, uh, it will start. Uh, so, you know because you uh, you know you are on a private one, and uh, in this particular instance, uh, this particular uh, you know uh, cluster that I'm running that off of is inside large. So I have eight GPUs to 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 utilize. Okay, go away. Sorry. Um, so uh, we automatically start a dusk scheduler, right? So in order to connect to the dusk scheduler, for those of you who are not familiar with this, uh, 8786 uh, 8, port is the, uh, the, the, the port that the uh, dusk scheduler is normally listening on for any connections from both the workers. If, they, if there is an additional worker that wants to register with the dusk scheduler, they would uh, ping, uh, you know, ping the, the, the scheduler, the scheduler on port 8786. And that way they are able to register themselves and say, hey, I'm here, I can, I can do some work. Uh, if you create a client, we also pass the IP address of the, uh, you know, where the dusk scheduler is running and the port 8786. And that way we automatically create a client against the already running uh, dusk scheduler. The client restart, effectively takes, uh, tells the, 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 the scheduler to dump all the memory that whatever you have in there, just dump it and then start from scratch. So effectively it just wipes out all the memory that you have, uh, you know, occupied by any other objects and then it gives you a kind of clean slate here. Now you notice that I'm using a pool equals to true in this particular uh, occasion. This is to, uh, you know, effectively what Blazing SQL will do is it will, uh, register or kind of like, you know, create this pool of memory, the GPU memory that we can quickly, uh, we have a very, very quick access to. So when we uh, register tables or we do any, uh, you know, uh, querying, it will effectively, uh, you know, uh, uh, do it more, uh, more quickly instead of just, qu you know, constantly allocating and deallocating the memory. So let me run this. This shouldn't take too long. And we're going to have the Blazing SQL context uh, back. Now, if you wanted to have access to the dashboard in the back, that's running, uh, you know, the, the, um, the dusk dashboard, you effectively can go just to the, uh, you know, the, um, uh, the IP port, uh, sorry, the, the, uh, IP address of, of the running cluster and then access that through 8787. Uh, that's where the dusk dashboard is, is, is effectively running. So right now what is happening, uh, the client is going out to every single worker and instantiating a blazing context uh, on, every single, on every single worker. It's, uh, you know, because we started from scratch, not all the workers might have registered already. So I'm going to run this again. So we're going to create a, a connect to the client and restart, uh, you know, the whole uh, the whole cluster again. So uh, it, 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 it's for me as a safe case that I definitely have access to all the eight, eight uh, you know, GPUs that I, uh, that I uh, subscribe for. Uh, in a similar manner, I'm gonna, uh, you know, uh, register my uh, S3 bucket. This is the same bucket that we, uh, we have used, but in this case, I will be using a, uh, you know, the Parking Seattle uh, you know, data set that spans pretty much five, four and a half years because we are mid, uh, I think the 2020 is up to July, if my memory serves me right. So uh, in this particular case, I'm just gonna pump through this. This is the same thing we've already seen. We create the tables. So same parking transactions, parking locations and day of the week, uh, same deal. So, uh, you know, we select 10. So right now we are selecting, you know, 10 transactions from a much larger, uh, you know, much larger uh, data set. So that will take a little bit longer, but not that much. So that took, you know, 11, 12 seconds. Now this will take a little bit longer and you can actually see a little bit what's happening behind the scenes. So what happens right now is, uh, you know, when we execute that cell, uh, blazing context will go to every single worker and then, uh, you know, uh, 
ask it to do, okay, give me a count from every single partition that you have, give me a count, right, from, uh, from, from every, uh, every partition. And then we say, okay, we have 1.3 billion records in this particular, uh, you know, uh, this particular data set. Uh, list of columns doesn't change uh, except for we now have a null dask index that is, uh, you know, um, an artifact of saving the data set into, uh, into the parking, uh, sorry, parquet format. Uh, you can run this transaction sample and compute that. It exactly looks the same as the, as the previous example. Uh, the parking locations hasn't changed, so I'm just gonna quickly pipe through this. We still have 1500, uh, you know, uh, records in this particular table. Uh, and it still looks, looks the same. And we still drop the, some of the uh, uh, duplicates down. Now, featureizing parking transactions. You remember that we've extracted year and month. We also extracted other things, but uh, for this particular example, I'm not going to do that. And I will just, uh, you know, in order to create this view, in this particular case, uh, we are creating a table that uh, summarizes the, the, the number of parking transactions per month, right? So uh, the, what we're gonna get back is a uh, QDF table, uh, uh, sorry, Dask QDF uh, data frame uh, named counts. And then what we're going to do uh, after that, is we're going to compute that, move it to pandas, set index to a year and month, and then do a plot. So, uh, okay, there we go. So as you can see, every single day, we have roughly, uh, you know, 2.5, no, sorry, 25, 25 million transactions in every single month. You can see that there's something happening, right? So this is the, the, the beauty of the whole, uh, for me, at least as a data scientist, uh, a beauty of, you know, working with rapids. Every single time, I can run a query very quickly. It took me 12 seconds to chew through 1.3 billion records on an eight GPU cluster that costs me $8 to run per hour. And I can straight away see that there's something wrong with the data that it has piped through for 2020, right? I can trust the data up to probably March, but after uh, April, May, and June, something is wrong. This might be, an, uh, like, you know, actually, you know, uh, quite easy to explain. Not necessarily something that is, you know, really wrong with the data, but it, it might be just the effect of, uh, you know, the, the restrictions that were in place for COVID, right? So in April, there would be much less people traveling and parking in Seattle. Or I haven't checked that out, but maybe, uh, you know, uh, city of Seattle actually lifted all the, you know, uh, uh, fees for, for parking. That I don't know, but you can tell straight away that, you know, by simply looking at the data, by summarizing in the data and working almost, you know, uh, in real time with the large data set that you can quickly spot some problems with, uh, you know, with, with, with the data that you're working with. Similarly, if we featureize the parking locations, once again, we are going to a 1.3 billion, billion uh, oh no, this is parking location. So this is 1500. Uh, 1500, uh, uh, oops, <laughs> uh, I run it one, one, one time too, too many. Uh, similarly, we create, uh, you know, we want to calculate the average occupancy. So right over here, you can see a quite complex uh, query with two inner tables. I have the original inner table that gives me the average occupancy. Then I calculate the, uh, uh, you know, additional check. So for some reason, there are uh, instances in the data set that you have more people parking than there's uh, available spots. Uh, it might be data fluke. It might be just the way that, uh, you know, the data is aggregated by the uh, Department of Transportation. Uh, so in this particular case, I, I'm saying that, okay, anything that is above 100%, just, uh, you know, trim it at 100%. And then we quickly create, this is the step where we create the means table. So uh, we do uh, day of the week, source of key, uh, hour of the day, and the mean occupancy. So if you run this on eight GPUs, 1.3 billion records with all of these, this quite, uh, you know, a complex query to run, it shouldn't take more than a couple of seconds. 
let's see what's happening. There you go, 16 seconds and we have the means table. So right now what you can do is to literally <laughs> uh, go back to what we've been doing so far and uh, get the results back. So right now, based on the, the query that we've done, we still try to go to you know uh, day of the week four and then hour of the day 17, so uh, 5 p.m. On, on Thursday. But now the, uh, the order might have changed. And also what we see that the mean occupancy has upda uh, you know, updated because we are looking right now at the much larger uh, you know, uh, time of the you know, time span. So this particular way, we, uh, you know, we, are, we, we can build more confidence and then we can do more with the data that we have. So as I said, like this is, this is precisely what I really value both about you know, the, the, the whole, pretty much the whole rapid ecosystem. I can iterate over this data. If I make a mistake at the very beginning, it literally took me to uh, you know, run this whole notebook. I, I was you know, clicking through, but if I were to run this, run all cells in this notebook, it would take me 20 seconds or you know, 30 seconds, which is nothing to, uh, to process 1.3 billion records and get a result uh, that I might not like, or I might have made a mistake and then something didn't work. And I can go back and then in the next 30 seconds fix, fix what I uh, didn't like. And in the next 30 seconds, I have, uh, you know, the results back that, uh, you know, might match my, uh, you know, uh, my, my expectations. Or I can experiment, right? I can, uh, you know, change things. I can, uh, you know, if I'm building a regression model, if I'm building a classification model, most of the time what we do, uh, you know, uh, building a machine learning model, we need to build different features. We need to derive from columns. We need to, sometimes we do, uh, you know, uh, take a logarithm of a numerical column or we combine columns together in order to, uh, you know, to, to do something and to build a new feature. I can iterate over you know, uh, this step in much quicker way than I was able to, uh, you know, to do before on a much larger cluster running on, uh, purely, purely on a CPU. All right, so I think that's it from me. Uh, Rodrigo, I'll probably hand it over to you, back to you, and then we can have some Q&A. Yeah, yeah, so we only have a few more minutes. I've been answering questions as they're coming in, so if you're all curious to see what people have been saying, there's a Q&A section. Okay. Um, let's see. Pablo Tercero is asking, are there more spec stocks on the private clusters? Um, yeah, so that's something. So there, for an extra small, you, you effectively get a one GPU instance. And for our largest size, which is a 4X large, you can go as much as uh, 128 GPUs, which have two terabytes of video memory. Over time, we're actually going to be benchmarking all of these cluster configurations for people. Um, so that they are going to be a little bit fluid behind the scenes and the user won't necessarily be able to, won't necessarily mind so much what's being put up for them as much as how much data can it process, how quickly can it process. So for example, we use really heavily the Tesla T4 GPUs right now because we see a ton of uh, cost, uh, cost benefit that, that shows them really working incredibly well. But there's a new A100 GPU coming out that, that we think will be able to let us make, you know, some really large clusters incredibly performant that'll be even more performant than that 128 uh, Tesla T4 system I was talking about. So we're gonna be changing it up a little bit behind the scenes. Uh, the way you should really think about it though, is that every size is basically two times larger than the size that came before it. So a small is twice as fast as an extra small, a medium is twice as fast as a, as a small and so on and so forth. Are there any other questions? So while I let uh, just like another minute for people to ask questions if they want to, I wanted to say, Tom, brilliant demo as always. I loved seeing it. Um, you all could kind of see how quickly and easily Tom was able to take a workload that worked on a single GPU and just launch a larger, a larger GPU system, start querying on it, go from 50, 49 million rows to 1.3 billion rows. And yeah, I mean, that was, that, that, was, that was just super duper impressive to me. And you can see how easy it was to get started. Correct, and it's still interactive. So that's, that's the, the biggest benefit for me, right? It's still interactive. I don't have to wait, you know, half an hour or an hour 
for the system to tell me that I made a mistake and I need to restart that, right? I, I know the, the, the answer to the questions that I have against the data almost instantly. And that way, this is, this is uh, you know, the, 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 the largest benefit coming from, uh, you know, being able to process one, a humongous and large data set, uh, uh, but also very quickly, right? So I can, I can iterate over the, you know, I have, mm -hmm. you know, one million, one million ideas every single uh, second. So I can, I can put those ideas and then questions against the data and then get the answer uh, almost instantly. Yeah. All right. Well, with that, we're at time. So um, if you have any further questions, you can follow us on Twitter. Twitter is the best place at Blazing SQL to hear about the latest and greatest. We tweet all the time, any updates, everything that's coming out and so on. So that's a really good place to, to look at us or look us up. Also, the Rapids Go AI. So for anyone not familiar, Rapids has a Slack channel. If you go to rapids.ai and go to their community tab, I think you can find an invite link. But that, that Slack channel is the best place to talk to all people or all things revolving around Rapids. And all the core contributors and maintainers of the ecosystem are, are available inside that, that, Slack, that, that Slack for you to be able to talk. And yeah, anything else, please. You can also reach out to us directly, Rodrigo at blazingsql.com, Tom at blazingsql.com. And we're gonna be doing a lot more of these talks. So in about two weeks, we hope to have another webinar planned. We'll post stuff about that later this week. And thanks a lot, everyone. Really hope you appreciated it and, and expect to hear more soon. Fantastic, thanks guys. Appreciate the time. See you next time. Thanks. Tom, you can you can end the webinar since you're the host now. Oh, gotcha. Okay. All right. Well, thanks very much. And uh, we'll see you next time. Bye. Bye.